Hello, everyone. My name is David Bush. I'm executive director for Preservation Houston. Thank you for being with us this evening for Preservation in Practice, part of the Bar Truck Silo program series named in memory of the Preservation Houston co-founder and pioneer preservationist Bar Truck Silo and generously supported by our members. Preservation Houston is funded in part by a grant from the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance and from the National Endowment for the Humanities through Humanities Texas. If you are a member of Preservation Houston, we're very grateful for your support. If you're not, please consider joining at preservationhouston.org slash join. Uh, Preservation Houston is a nonprofit organization and these programs are an important part uh, of fulfilling our mission to promote the benefits of historic preservation through education and advocacy. Now I'm happy to introduce our programs director, Jim Parsons. Thanks David and, and thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, Joe Meppelink. He's principal and co-founder of MetaLab Architecture along with his partner, Andrew Brana. He's also a partner and co-founder of Janus Design, a residential design practice specializing in historic renovations and additions with his wife, Marissa. Joe has a bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan and a master's in architecture from Rice University. Both MetaLab Architecture and Janus Design have studio space in Houston's East End where they've purchased and renovated a 1940s late Art Deco building, uh, which I think you're gonna hear about in a bit. MetaLab and Janice's work has been honored with several Good Brick Awards from Preservation Houston over the years. And one of their recent projects, the restoration of a home in Riverside Terrace is going to be receiving a 2021 Good Brick Award. So congratulations on that. Joe serves as board chairman of the East End Management District, advisory board member and building committee chair for MECA, Multicultural Education and Counseling Through the Arts, Projects Committee member for Herman Park Conservancy and founding board member for Every Shelter, an organization that's dedicated to improving refugee shelters worldwide through human-centered design. We are really excited to have him here to talk about uh, the restoration of one of our landmarks in the downtown historic district. So I will turn it over to you, Joe, and I'll see you in a few minutes for the Q&A. Thank you, Jim and David. I assume uh, you and everybody else can hear me. Um, so thank you very much to uh, Jim, David, Preservation Houston, uh, all of you, all of the staff, and board members, uh, Preservation Houston for uh, hosting this event and for uh, making Houston a better place by caring about historic buildings uh, as you do. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, one of our very favorite projects and. Uh, what has always been one of my favorite buildings in Houston, uh, the Kayyem Building. Uh, Kayyem Building is uh, located at, uh, at the corner of Main and Preston in downtown Houston. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to just uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, myself and our practice. Uh, here is uh, where you can find me uh, on the on the internet and the social media. This is my Instagram handle. I highly recommend using those hashtag search terms. Otherwise you're gonna run across a bunch of videos and photographs of me climbing. Um, and if you look really closely, you may find a, a picture of me climbing a historic building. Um, and importantly, the last line there, my email, um, I'm gonna go through a lot of information today on, on the Kayyem building. Uh, it's got such a storied history. If any of you know anything about the Kayyem building that, that I don't know, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of folks do or, or have any personal stories uh, about the building, uh, people who may know of, of its uh, more about its history or any other just general questions, please feel free to email me, uh, joe at metallabstudio.com. Um, as Jim mentioned, uh, we, uh, we do uh, ourselves occupy a historic building. Uh, this is it, 20 Samson. Uh, we're a proud, uh, um, proud residents uh, here, our company in the uh, East End. Um, we're at the corner of uh, Samson and McCashin, which is between Commerce and Canal. Uh, the building uh, originally was built in 1940 and it was the architectural engineering office of, uh, of um, M.R. Van Valkenburg. 
1950, the edition that you see here was, uh, was done for Houston Saw Knife Works, and then a later edition in 1962. So uh, it's got a wonderful uh, history here in the East End. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the building as it looks today, our office. Um, and if you ever come by for a visit, I will turn on the misting tree for you. Um, we moved out here to the East End uh, almost six years ago, and it was a result of this project. And many of you may know this. Um, this, is, uh, this is a big part of what drew us to the East End. This is uh, fire station number two, uh, owned by Michael Skelly and Ann Whitlock, our clients and uh, dear friends, uh, just three blocks uh, down the road here from us on Samson. There's the overhead view. And for those who may remember, uh, all these houses with the standing seam metal roof were moved, six of them. These are all 1890s Victorian houses uh, that were moved over in uh, January of 2014. And uh, it was quite a, quite a fun event um, happening overnight, uh, late on a Saturday night. Um, some other projects that we've been involved with, and I'm gonna move through these quickly, but this is very close to home for me. Uh, uh, Jim mentioned that I'm uh, on the board at Mecca, Multicultural Education and Counseling Through the Arts. You see their logo there in the upper left. They occupy a wonderful historic building in the heart of the old Sixth Ward Historic District, the Dow School. It was built in 1912 with later additions in 1923 and uh, 1945. Um, I've, I've been on the board there for many years. Uh, in 2009, I was the chairman of the building committee uh, and we uh, did a substantial exterior renovation, including uh, the outdoor performance pavilion, which was a project of the University of Houston graduate design build program that you see on the left. Of course, the historic image on the right. And then uh, very recently, our firm uh, wa uh, worked with the uh, old six ward TERS uh, to create the Dow Elementary Park on the other side of the building, the west side of the building. And uh, this, uh, this park includes a pavilion called the Longhouse, uh, which is 14 feet wide and 120 feet long and references the form and roof and soffit materials uh, of, uh, of many of the old houses in the neighborhood. And we, uh, we employed reclaimed, um, uh, 100 plus year old uh, material, beadboard, shiplap, and other soffit materials to uh, clad the underside of each of these gables with. And this is our original diagram uh, showing how all these different functions worked. Uh, so even though this is a new building, it was very much rooted in the uh, historic uh, place uh, in the old Sixth Ward. And uh, another uh, interesting kind of recent, recently completed renovation project. This is a, uh, a, a, non, a relatively nondescript 1943 uh, church building, a load bearing masonry and bowstring truss building uh, that we recently renovated for uh, Sojourn Heights, uh, Sojourn Church in the Heights. This is uh, on uh, Aurora Street, just to the west of North Main. And then I, I, I am uh, always grateful to our uh, dear friends, uh, David and Benny Ansel, who, when we moved to the old Sixth Ward uh, 20 years ago, 20, 21 years ago now, uh, they were uh, among the first to uh, befriend us and share with us the um, the methods and the care and uh, really the joy of restoring uh, historic structures. Um, we later worked with them on renovations of their house and more recently on the renovation of this building that they are uh, working on themselves over the last five to six years. This is 2020 Hardy um, and has a wonderful blog. If you look up 2020 Hardy, uh, Benny Ansel, who's a photographer and artist uh, has been uh, taking wonderful photographs of this, of this building. Uh, this is the old Zach's uh, general store, a, again, a load bearing brick masonry building built in 1900 in, uh, in the near north side, uh, just a wonderful structure. And um, through David Benny, we really learned uh, the importance of 
having a very light touch on historic structures, uh, reusing everything that you possibly can and uh, saving everything that you possibly can in an old, in an old structure. Um, and uh, that's something that they've, they've done uh, just expertly on this building um, and, uh, and of course their own house and something we've, uh, we've learned and taken to heart over the years. So uh, onto the Kayam building, and I'll return to some of these uh, some of these lessons from our past projects as we uh, move along here. Um, the Kayam building was uh, built in 1893. Uh, it is uh, uh, it was uh, uh, designed. It was built and commissioned originally by Edward Kayam, uh, who was described as a public relations and merchandising wizard uh, when he was only 29 years old. It was designed by architect Henry C. Holland. And I would love it if anybody could uh, uh, give uh, uh, pass along a little more information on Henry C. Holland. Uh, there's another well-known architect, British architect, Henry Holland, who is completely, um, you know, covered, uh, has got the internet completely covered up with, uh, with any mention of Henry Holland architect. So Henry C. Holland, I can find very little on. Uh, but he did work with uh, local consulting architects, George Dickey and uh, Ollie Lauren. And Ollie Lauren, interestingly, was the architect of fire station number two. So uh, this is, uh, is and was the world's largest small town, uh, something, something we all love about Houston. Uh, the structure is a five-story uh, load-bearing brick masonry building. Uh, it has cast iron columns and steel beams at the basement, first and second floor. Um, and... Uh, my virus software is expiring. How about that? Um, and uh, wood columns and beams on the third, fourth, and fifth, fifth floors. Um, the floor framing and roof framing uh, is wood uh, throughout. Um, the building had two original electric elevators, uh, rumored to be the first in Houston. Uh, it was designed in a Romanesque revival style, also, known, also referred to as Richardsonian, which is kind of, uh, you know, uh, after Henry Hobson Richardson, who actually practiced from about 1850 to 18, mid-1880s. And uh, that style was actually referencing um, a, a very early uh, 12th through 14th century French and Spanish uh, styles of Romanesque, uh, Romanesque architecture. Um, and this was, a, this was a very popular style in the 1880s uh, prior to uh, Beaux-Arts inf influences and, and neoclassical influences that, uh, that started to come into vogue uh, after, after the uh, 1893 Columbian Exposition, otherwise known as the Chicago World's Fair. Um, the Kayam building was also accompanied by the Kayam Annex. And if you can see my cursor here, it's this, um, this area here. Uh, this is just to the north of the Kayam building. Uh, interesting uh, fact about that, the deed restriction that went with the 40 by 100 foot parcel that the five story building is built on uh, disallowed that parcel to be recombined or replatted with another parcel. Uh, but Kayam, uh, the, you know, being the uh, merchandising wizard that he was, uh, didn't, uh, you know, wanted to uh, have some additional uh, space and uh, built the Kayam Annex itself, a three-story uh, building uh, in uh, contemporary with the five-story building you see here. Um, the Kayam building is a, uh, a historic landmark designated by both uh, city and state, and it is a contributing structure to the uh, main, uh, I think it's called the Main Street and Market Square Historic District uh, here in Houston. And that historic district was uh, I believe it was the first designated historic district in Houston, um, dating to uh, 1984. And Jim and David could probably correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, I wanna just use this, uh, I, I never miss a chance to, <laughs> to uh, kind of explain um, the importance of, uh, uh, of, of historic preservation and the, and the kind of general um, uh, place uh, that this building uh, occupies uh, relative to its uh, historic landmark status. So obviously national historic landmarks, um, this is not one of those. This is a, uh, again, a state and locally designated landmarks, landmark. Um, so, uh, but uh, it, it is one of the obviously finest buildings in, in, in Houston. 
um, national landmarks uh, have uh, national significance uh, and an ability to illustrate US, uh, US heritage. Texas landmarks are awarded to buildings that are uh, architecturally or historically significant in Texas, and this certainly uh, qualifies for that. And then Houston landmarks are designated locally by the Houston Archaeological and Historical Commission, the division of the planning department. And uh, it is assigned, as I mentioned earlier, to contributing structures within city designated historic districts. Um, the, the thing I want to point out here, uh, and for those who happen to come to uh, the uh, uh, RDA uh, lecture, uh, I guess it was probably a year and a half ago, it was the RDA Civic Forum titled Obsolescence. This slide may look familiar to you, and this is a point I made at that, uh, at that talk and, what, and that I want to make again here. Um, there's a fourth category of historic structure. It's the others. It's the ones that aren't in a historic district, that aren't designated, right? The, the Sojourn Heights uh, projects, you know, these, these are not uh, necessarily historically relevant buildings uh, at the state level or even the local level. Um, but there are so many of these, kind of these other buildings out there that are historic and that are, are, are in need of, um, of protection and should be, uh, should be restored and should be, um, uh, you know, given, uh, given new life and the attention of good designers and good architects. Um, you know, these are, and these are some of the reasons uh, <laughs> that we all know, I think I'm preaching to the choir here when I run down the column on the right side, uh, why we do this location, uniqueness, authenticity, community, diversity, urban context, of course, walkability, history, the thing that really drives us and binds our practice together, quality, uh, because we have such a, a strange and diverse practice at Metal Lab. A lot of people wonder what, why we do public art projects and this kind of high tech stuff. And then we also work on historic buildings. Well, it's quality. Uh, quality is the common thread that binds those things together for us. Um, and sustainability and quality are really uh, the same thing. They are one and the same. Um, when something is built to last, one never has to worry about that thing going into the landfill. Um, rather than being recycled, it is upcycled. Good quality buildings are used over and over and over again and, uh, and, and can always have a successful, uh, you know, successful place uh, in, in, uh, in the kind of real estate uh, context. Of, of the cities they're in. Uh, on the left, we've all heard these terms, right? The reasons that we don't, that people don't want to do historic buildings, the reason, the reasons people will opt to tear something down instead of fix it up, right? Lead paint, asbestos, rotten termites, bad foundations, structural issues, environmental issues. You know, maybe the neighborhood isn't quite there. Uh, my personal favorite, the cost and the complexity of getting an old building up to code, accessibility. And the one that I love to highlight and always, always want to take a couple of minutes to mention is parking. Old buildings did not have parking. They did, they did not have parking ordinances back in those days. In the case of the Cayenne building, they didn't even have cars. Um, so it'd be great to think about at a city level um, here in Houston, uh, retooling our parking ordinance to uh, reduce or eliminate parking for historic buildings. And not just historic buildings that are uh, nationally, state, or, or locally designated, but the others, all of them. If a building was, is more than 50 years old, let's take it easy on the parking requirements. I mean, this would be a huge gift to people who, uh, uh, who want to uh, work on old buildings. So I'll get off my soapbox and we'll move on here to the Cayenne building. Okay. Now I'm going to I'm going to zoom in here because this uh, this is the oldest photo we have of the Cayenne building. This is uh, shortly after its completion uh, on or around 1893, 1894, 1895. Uh, this is a really great image and I love to see uh, some of the old signs here um, hanging on the walls. The really interesting thing here about these uh, about the uh, upper story here, you'll notice here, and if I, I don't know if y'all can read this on your screen, it's very faint, but it says G-E-O F Dickey architect, and here as well. Now George George Dickey was one of the two consulting 
architects on the project, along with uh, Ollie Lauren, one of the local architects of record. Clearly, uh, George, uh, Mr. Dickey was proud enough of this building that he wanted to take not just any office, but the top floor corner office of the building. So um, to, to our clients, if you're, if you're listening, maybe we can work a deal. I love, my, I love our spot in the East End, but uh, that, that's a pretty beautiful space up there. So maybe, maybe, we can, uh, maybe we can work something out for the top floor. Uh, other things here on the top floor, you can see some of the original uh, uh, cornice and parapet wall details over here on the Kayam Annex and also on the Kayam building itself. It had this, this uh, above the, um, the uh, uh, sheet metal cornice, uh, some really wonderful decorative uh, elements at the corners uh, of, the, uh, of the parapet wall and then here above the original stair tower. Um, you can also see here in the distance some uh, original buildings which are no longer standing. And on the ground level, um, what I imagine is a kind of a bustling busy day in uh, downtown Houston. And there's some interesting things to note in this, uh, in this image as well. Of course, the uh, awnings uh, that you see here, some of them are folded up. You see that the Kayams uh, awnings occupy the entire second floor. And then just a couple on the third floor as well, although most of the third floor was, uh, was leased to other offices. Here's, uh, here's a, uh, a loan and benefit company of Texas. Uh, the literature that we have says uh, that the, there were 43 offices in the upper floors of the Kayam building. So this was kind of a, um, you know, kind of an 1890s uh, WeWork situation. Um, Ground floor, uh, you can see uh, here some of the plate glass that looks to have, looks like it has uh, some signage perhaps painted on the glass. Uh, you can see a bit of reflection there. Uh, here again, there seems to be some signage uh, painted on glass and you can see the, the, uh, the uh, angled or battered uh, uh, brick pilasters here coming down uh, at the angles. Uh, and the, um, the uh, side entrance here to the upper floors. This is the original uh, office entrance uh, to the original staircase that runs up the uh, west side of the building. Um, this, um, uh, of course, all of these lines here are catenaries for the cable cars. You can see a cable car here uh, peeking out of the corner. Um, uh, there's a variety of, uh, of light poles. Electricity was a fairly new thing at this point. Um, and, uh, and then this is, this is a really interesting uh, moment in the building here. And, and you'll see a difference uh, between the way this is detailed originally and the way it is, has been uh, restored. And I'll show you that in a later photograph. Um, Jim, uh, Jim Parsons, as we were talking about this just the other day, uh, said that he had read someplace that this uh, area on the second floor was a ladies lounge for the Kayam store. And uh, this was this ladies lounge functioned as kind of a lookout. So uh, people could come up here and sit and have coffee or tea and they could look out the windows and see who was coming into the store. If it was somebody they liked or didn't like, then they could uh, prepare accordingly uh, for the for the, the social situation that would follow. Um, so this is a this is a really really interesting um, uh, detail and, and arguably the most uh, uh, um, the, the most uh, significant uh, architectural feature of this uh, of the building still to this day. Uh, this is a photograph of, uh, of the Kayam building. I, I believe this is somewhere pre-1900. Uh, the reason I say that is the uh, cornice is still here. And I read in, uh, in, in uh, some of our uh, research that the uh, sheet metal cornice uh, up here was blown off in the Galveston hurricane of 1900, which of course devastated Galveston and then rolled on through Houston. Uh, but you can see here in this building, there are there's some uh, added, uh, signage. I like to think that this is uh, electrified neon or light lighted signage of some sort uh, on the top corner of the building. And also here at the, um, at the uh, large uh, arched opening, the, um, the ladies lounge. 
and there's some other painted signage here. Uh, of course, a lot of the awnings are up uh, today, so maybe that's a different time of year. Um, and then, uh, and, and Kayyem's continued on through, uh, through the early part of the 20th century. In 1917, and I won't bore you all by reading uh, this, but if anybody would like to see this, uh, you know, let, let me know and I can go back and pause on it. Uh, but uh, in 1917, uh, and I don't know what happened to uh, Ed, Edward Kayyem, uh, but the, uh, in 1917, you see here that there's a trustee for the creditors uh, who uh, bought the building and, uh, and there was a ground lease as well on the building, a hundred year ground lease, uh, which uh, was going to expire here, it says in 2019, last year. Uh, it's kind of interesting to think uh, about that ground lease and I'm sure that ground lease was since, uh, was since uh, purchased. But uh, it was uh, in 1917 leased to uh, the Sackowitz brothers who had a store in Galveston and were expanding into Houston. So the Sackowitz brothers did, uh, did quite a number on the store. Uh, there's a number of changes uh, and modernizations that were done. And uh, it's interesting to see here, uh, they uh, gathered uh, both the Kayyem Annex and the Kayyem building itself together under a large um, street level awning. Uh, these uh, tension rods here that you see were, uh, were used to support the awning, but the ground floor, this, uh, this glass and uh, marble base that you see down here at the bottom were, uh, were extended outward a few feet. So the building uh, footprint was actually enlarged on the ground level and a significant canopy was added. And then here you can see some of those buildings that we pointed out previously are now gone and the Ritz uh, Theater is, uh, is in place here. Uh, now the Ritz Theater is dated to 1926. So that leads me to think that this photo is probably in the you know, uh, you know, late 20s. Now, it's interesting to take a look at these two photos uh, together to notice the differences. Um, so there's some, there's some really, you know, of course the primary difference is the, uh, what was done on the ground floor. Uh, a, a plate glass uh, modernization of, of the ground level. Um, and we know that the Sackowitz brothers traveled to New York at the, at, in 1917 to uh, look at uh, some of the best in modern uh, retail stores in New York at the time and uh, brought that, uh, brought that uh, inspiration back here to Houston. Um, you can see here the, the uh, clear story, uh, uh, or transom windows rather, are still intact above the awning. They would have provided light uh, deep into the interior of the building. And, and uh, thankfully those transom windows are still there, original uh, 1893 transom windows are still there. Uh, the ladies lounge has been closed in, sadly. Um, that, that was, uh, I'm not sure if that was blocked off or boarded off, but you can see here uh, Sackowitz Brothers signage. Uh, I think perhaps they took in that space for uh, some additional square footage. The building was painted, as you can see, it's painted white in the original. It was uh, uh, exposed brick with a two color paint job on the uh, windows, uh, on the uh, brick mold, uh, window jams and sashes, a darker color sash and a lighter color on the brick mold and jams. Um, here, the entire building is painted. Uh, the fire escape was added, although I will point out, and I just noticed this earlier today, here in the, you know, I think late 1890s, like you can see uh, fire escape platforms uh, that have been added and what looks like a ladder. And I just noticed that today. And then if you move forward here to the 1917 Sackowitz renovation, you see those platforms perhaps enlarged or extended or rebuilt altogether. And rather than a ladder, uh, now we have, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, angled stairs. And then perhaps the most important uh, or, or most um, uh, substantial 
renovation uh, at the time was the simplification of the cornice. Now I mentioned earlier that the sheet metal cornice may have been uh, or is purported to have been blown off in 1900 and that and it may have stayed off it may not have been rebuilt between 1900 and 1917 we don't know that um, but other things like the kind of decorative uh, spheres and uh, parapet brickwork that you see here on the original is gone in favor of a very simplified um, stepped brick uh, parapet um, the uh, you know the uh, kind of brick uh, bracketing here uh, under the former cornice is original but the cornice itself is gone and it appears if you look at the distance here from those details up that uh, that that parapet wall was uh, was shortened substantially uh, this is uh, now, we, I'm missing several historic photographs uh, here between 1917 and this photograph, which is, I believe, 1970s. Um, we, uh, we do know that uh, the, the uh, Birds uh, department store uh, occupied the building then from, 19, uh, from about 1929 uh, to 1940. Birds in 1934 uh, did a substantial renovation uh, one block south of here on the corner of Maine and Prairie. And that was a project that 15 years ago, I had the good fortune to be the architect on when I was with uh, Ray and Hollington Architects. And that was, uh, that was renovated to, uh, by Fretz Construction, who also is the owner of the building, uh, Bob Fretz Jr. Um, and was renovated into condos at that time. So uh, again, the world's largest small town. Um, you know, connections are being made throughout history here, it seems. Um, so Birds, Birds was in this building, at least on the ground levels from, uh, from about 1929 to 1940. And then from 1940 uh, through about 1979, it was uh, Cannon's uh, Economy Shoe Corner. And it's interesting here, you can see, you know, Cannon's uh, clearly didn't do a whole lot to the building. The fire, uh, the fire escape is the same, exactly the same as it was in 1917. The light colored paint job you see here is uh, probably <laughs> the 1917 paint job. Of course, it's been weathered off, uh, exposing the original brick again. Even the Sackowitz, uh, um, uh, infill of the uh, archway is still the black and you can see just some very faint light colored uh, lettering uh, from the from the Sackowitz renovation in 1917. Uh, of course the paint has all peeled off of the windows leaving exposed wood at this point. Um, and it's, again it's kind of interesting to look uh, kind of back and forward in history. Uh, here, here I point out the uh, 1950s uh, slipcover, uh, the home of Easy Credit, or Dean's Credit Clothing, as it's also known. Um, interestingly, this is the f this was the when I first came to Houston in 1997 to go to Rice. This was the only bar downtown, and it was a speakeasy. You had to knock on the door and kind of know some people to get in there. But uh, I took my girlfriend Marisa Janis, who was visiting from New York City, uh, to the home of Easy Credit. Marisa, if you're watching now sorry to out you like this but we sat in this window here and marveled at how we could sit in a vacant downtown Houston in a window that had no guardrail uh, looking across the street at the Harris County Administration Building um, you know <laughs> it was uh, it was surreal to say the least um, but anyway this is a kind of a classic 1950s slipcover over the um, the original uh, Chiam Annex. Um, and of course, that structure is still there. Um, this, uh, this extended parapet here was lopped off. You can see uh, here from the relative height of the slip cover to the windows here. That would be right about here at the sash. So that stuff is gone. And uh, there is a 1880, 1893 building under all that. Fascinating to think. And then, of course, on this end of the building, you see, um, you know, what were uh, some kind of 
perhaps again, uh, Romanesque revival uh, buildings uh, replaced in 1926 uh, by the, by the uh, Majestic Theater, which is uh, still standing there today. Um, and this is a, uh, this is a, I believe a Paul Hester photo uh, from the mm, 1979, I believe. So this is one of the last photos we have showing the building before its 1980 renovation. Uh, and again, another uh, photo here from uh, the late seventies, early eighties, showing uh, just some kind of ghosts of the uh, Sackowitz renovation. And uh, just noticing that for the first time. And then, uh, and then in 1980, there was a, a substantial renovation done by uh, Barry Moore. And uh, I, I can't say enough good things about the work that Barry Moore did on this. Um, he was a uh, colleague of mine briefly at the University of Houston. Uh, he's uh, retired, I think now for the last uh, four or five years or so. Uh, he was with Gensler. Um, leading their uh, historic uh, work um, and best known for his work on the Idison Library downtown, just a fantastic renovation. And this is too, um, uh, all of the heavy lifting was done. As you can see here up at the top, the cornice is rebuilt, uh, this time in, I believe, cast stone. Um, although I could not bring myself to hang over the edge enough to, you know, to really feel it and figure out what it is, but it's either cast stone or real stone. Um, uh, the, uh, the extension, the parapet extension that I showed earlier is not, was not rebuilt. This is a flat cap here on the top, but, uh, but nonetheless, just the fact that this work was done is tremendous. Um, all of the existing windows are still there. So uh, everything from this level up, the, um, the transom windows uh, that are hidden behind these awnings are original 1893 and every window in this building, with the exception of these, is original 1893 material. It's been painted um, in 1980. They also did a paint job on the building, uh, painted it red. Um, that was probably a decision that was um, was made to uh, save uh, save the building from being sandblasted. Um, that's often not a great thing to do to old bricks. Um, but the, uh, the the painting here uh, certainly does a lot to to uh, you know to uh, Help keep the old brick and mortar intact. So, so having this painted in 1980 has, has uh, certainly done a lot to uh, uh, maintain the quality and integrity of the brick over the years. Um, even the archway was opened back up. And it's interesting to note here that uh, the archway was a little bit different um, in the past than it is today. And let's see, did I do? Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, I'm going to just zoom back up here real quick. You'll notice here Originally, the the uh, the windows in this archway they curved uh, convex here on both sides, and then they curved here uh, in section, kind of a cove detail. So the windows curved uh, over to meet the ceiling, which is really a tremendous detail. I wish uh, I wish we could have uh, seen that or had some original drawings to kind of understand how that was done. But you can see the wedge here where those curves intersect. You know, you have this vertical curve intersecting with a curve in plan. And here you see that, uh, that intersection. So in 1980, and I'm sure, I'm sure Barry Moore was aware of that, but it, it, it was probably a cost prohibitive uh, um, uh, thing to do in, in 1980. So what was done here is uh, uh, vertical windows, uh, three panes here, uh, curving convex, and then a, a flat section here in the middle and a, uh, and, and a uh, a flat ceiling uh, or soffit above that, but nonetheless, the effect is the effect is very much there, um, and uh, so uh, it's just just tremendous to, that we have all this uh, original material uh, to work with. Um, let's see now. I'm, I'm sure you want to know what we're going to do with the building. So uh, this is this is how we start, and this is a very important first step for us. Uh, in any time we work on a historic project, whether whether it's a house or a commercial building, um, uh, and frankly, whether it's historic or not, um, this this uh, this act of surveying an old building, of measuring uh, e measuring every last bit of it, putting your hands on it, walking through it, and spending the hours and it, in, in this case days, uh, walking through this uh, this building. 
they they give us that gives us the time as as uh, as uh, as designers and architects to really understand the place to figure it out to to kind of commit this building to memory in some ways and to and to understand how it works and uh, start to kind of see through the layers and and uh, and see you know you can then begin to see what was there by uh, by measuring and then drawing the building so this is this is how we do that um, you know we just uh, we, we go with a, a laser and a tape measure and, and it's a, it's kind of an arduous process now when a building is five stories tall and and has all all of this uh, you know incredible detail on the exterior how do you how do you begin to measure and document all that well this is where technology comes into play so we uh, we uh, we had been aware of this firm for quite a while um, uh, they um, Oh, and I'm going to blank on their names. I'm so sorry. Richard Lassiter is the is the uh, smart uh, smart geometrics uh, was their I, I believe it's smart geometrics. Uh, and there it's a Houston based company, um, and uh, they do uh, high definition, high resolution laser scanning. And laser scanning uh, uh, works uh, with a, a tripod and it, it throws out a, a lasers and and. Uh, and they bounce off uh, just like radar bounces off the material and comes back. So it creates these point clouds and they have to take several different, um, you know, when they, when they laser scan, there are several, several different vantage points that they have to set up. If you set up from only one vantage point, you get shadowing and you can see some of that shadowing here, this dark area here. That's, uh, that's because they set the tripod up on the ground level and shot upward. So the top of, uh, of a, you know, of a, uh, cornice or parapet is, is not going to register to the laser scanner. Again, here, the entire top of the building from the edge of the cornice back does not register. It's in the shadow um, of, the, of the laser scan. And then here you can see uh, this line coming up here. This is actually the shadow of the, uh, the Homo VZ credit or the Kaya Annex building. So they set, when they set the tripod up way over here and they shot this way, they were able to see this back wall of the building. And in fact, here you can even see the brick texture on the wall, of, on, the, on that uh, north wall of the building, as you can here on the west wall of the building and the shadow line of the adjacent buildings. Um, but what this, was, uh, what this gave to us was this very high resolution point cloud from which we could then develop what I think are now my favorite drawings in the entire practice that we've done. Um, you know, these, uh, these are um, line drawings that are extracted from, uh, from, the, uh, from the point cloud. Um, so just uh, in, the, in the, so the detail that we have here is, I think the, uh, I think the accuracy is plus or minus a quarter of an inch on, on every line on here. Um, so it's just a, just a wonderful uh, level of detail that we're able to have. And not only is it telling us um, what we have in the, uh, I want to check my time here, 714, I got to wrap up. It, it not only tells us what we have in the building, it also tells us what we don't want to have. So these dashed lines here are things that are going to go away, uh, things that need to be removed from the building, you know, old light fixtures, canopies, old signage, things like that. So what are we going to do to the building? I, and I don't want to dwell too much on this. I'm happy to come back to some of these slides if there are questions. Uh, but I, I will say that it's very important with an old building to to understand it not just um, not just uh, from a design and tectonic standpoint, but also from a financial standpoint. So, you know, when we look at old buildings like this, we are looking for ways to uh, to bring out the inherent native qualities of a historic building, but also make make the building more efficient. Um, so, you know, here we, look, this is the floor plan as it exists right now. Um, it, there was a former restaurant tenant, a lobby to upper levels, uh, building, building management storage area. These are, you know, these yellow and pink areas don't, don't make our clients any money. So we want to change those yellow and pink areas to green, to leasable square footage. Um, so we worked up uh, what we thought would be a more a clear, better floor plan. 
with, again, a restaurant or a retail tenant and a smaller retail suite, about an 800 square foot, 850 square foot retail, uh, retail suite uh, for a service provider, such as a you know, barber shop or a, you know, coffee shop downtown, uh, something that would uh, be synergistic with the restaurant use. And then we're really minimizing and clarifying uh, the common areas. So here it is without all the coding and just some kind of basic furniture placement to, so that we can st uh, start to understand scale. And uh, a few things we showed the owners, just some inspiration images uh, for, uh, for that ground level. And these are, these are inspiration images for, sorry, these images here are some, you know, kind of inspiration images for the bar restaurant. And then here, the Sweet B retail, where what we're doing here is, is creating a very simple symmetrical space with a door and two windows on either side. And uh, we are, our goal here is to expose four cast iron columns across the back of the space. Um, and so, you know, we we hope to kind of have this have this kind of feel uh, to that to that space. Um, and then what does that mean to the exterior of the building? Um, well, again, you know, Barry Moore in 1980 did a, a, a fantastic job of renovating this building. Our job is not to screw this up. Um, and, and really, we, we, you know, we always want to have just the lightest touch on, on, um, on historic renovation. So we're, we're trying to uh, really enhance um, the, um, the spaces. So what, what we, the opportunities we see here, obviously this was a, a later renovation post 1980 that was done, uh, we think in the maybe early nineties, uh, a couple of not so great doors here. Uh, we've got a restaurant vent happening uh, right there that, and canopies and signage that we need to remove. Um, and as you notice, if you notice this in the plan, we are proposing to put a new door here and here and a new stair. These are these are tricky things because it's a historically designated building, um, but because these uh, because that ground level infill was removed in 1917 and rebuilt in 1980, it gives us a little bit of flexibility and freedom to uh, to make a few changes as long as, long as they are proportionally, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, correct. Uh, for the for the building and uh, and are built in their own time and are not competing with uh, the original historic material uh, elsewhere on the building. So these these two doors and this stair these are these are kind of the big moments uh, that we had to you know coordinate carefully with um, with uh, the Texas Historic Commission and and with our our, our wonderful partner um, Anna Maud and uh, uh, with the McRosty Historic Advisors. Um, and uh, she's she is guiding us and our clients through the tax credit process uh, um, and, and the process of uh, getting Texas Historic Commission approval for this. So this is this is uh, uh, again these are elevations as they exist now, and then you can see here the very subtle changes. So here we go to a set of double doors. We're carrying a lower style across uh, to, to match uh, uh, the uh, work that Barry Moore did. There's a checkerboard tile pattern down here now uh, that was referenced uh, from the uh, original 19, 1893 photos. Um, so this, you know, this, these three bays here would be the uh, small retail suite. And then this would be uh, from here forward would be the uh, restaurant with a front entrance and then a side entrance uh, to some outdoor uh, patio seating area. And then here we're looking at a new door and side light set for the, uh, uh, for the uh, entrance to the uh, upper levels. Uh, this is the basement plan. Uh, it, the building does have a full basement with approximately nine, nine to 10 foot ceilings. Uh, it's a really interesting space um, and it has a lot of potential. This is something we're trying to capture this is all currently unrentable space. We want to try to take, a, again, do a little selective demolition and reveal uh, what could be a, a really, uh, uh, you know, beautiful exposed brick and plaster walls uh, throughout. Uh, we've got our light well and open stair here so that people outside and uh, on the first floor can see that there's a basement level. Um, and, and if, the, you know, if we can see the space down there, then that space will, will 
have value. Uh, we want to try to expose again the original cast iron columns here. Unfortunately, you, you're you know where uh, the owners were compelled uh, many years ago to uh, dedicate a substantial space to uh, an electrical vault for center point to serve the building. Um, but there is plenty of room left here, and the uh, elevator that was installed in 1980 also serves the basement. So, um, so you'd come down here to a waiting area, a few tables, private dining area, and a bar. And then here's some inspiration images, and also inspiration images for the stair. Again, the stair is something we want to kind of build in our own time. We see the stair as being a very modern clean, minimal insertion into the historic fabric of the building. And then here I'm jumping up to the fifth floor because, uh, or sorry, I'm jumping up to here to this, uh, this is the second floor. Um, uh, second, uh, all the upper floors of this building have historically been uh, law offices uh, serving the county and other, uh, you know, downtown businesses. They were cut up uh, in the 80s and later. Uh, our, our goal for this renovation is to uh, just start by exposing what's there. Um, you know, the, we may look at full floor office tenants. We may end up uh, cutting the building up into offices again. And there's, and there's even some, uh, some talk and discussion about moving, uh, moving to full floor uh, residential uh, flats um, on second, third, fourth, and fifth floors. So here you see the, the stair that was added in 1980, the, the new elevator uh, toilets, of course, were added in the original stair location. And then I'm gonna move up here to the fifth floor. You'll notice the walls are thinner. Um, sorry, is this, oh no, this is the fourth floor. And you'll see here that there's an area well that's carved out of the building that does not exist here on the, se on the uh, second floor. Uh, area well is third through fifth floors. Uh, so you can see the difference in the floor plate. And on the top floor is this uh, really, uh, and, and we believe this exists on uh, third, fourth, and fifth floors, uh, this wonderful Y-shaped column, which we've seen before uh, in some of our other work. This is, uh, this is the interior of 2020 Hardy, which I showed you earlier. Why is there a Y-shaped column? Well, because in the Richardsonian style, uh, in, in fact, many architectural styles, you don't want, you, you want an odd number of windows on the front facade. In this case, there are five. Uh, in the case of the, uh, the uh, 2020 Hardy, Zach's General Store, there were three uh, windows on the front facade, uh, three storefronts and three windows above, uh, above that. And the Y-shaped column uh, spreads that column load that runs down the center of the building to either side of the window, to the masonry on either side of that window. Um, something, and this is, this is an interior photo of our uh, fire station renovation, uh, just down the street here, fire station two. Uh, this is a, a lesson that, uh, well, a couple of things. We, you know, notice that the column capitals here in the, in the uh, third through fifth floors uh, of the, uh, of the Kayam building. Um, the cladding of the beams has been removed. Uh, but the cladding still exists here at 2020, and it does here as well on uh, Fire Station 2. In this case, it's beadboard, um, and there is some trim here on uh, 2020 Hardy, which is missing here, but I, we can see some evidence of trim that was probably very similar to this. So, you know, we're, there's some, there's some um, sleuthing uh, that, we'll, that we'll be doing here. Uh, one of the next uh, steps we're taking with the owners is to uh, uh, undertake a selective demolition of the interior of the building, which is going to remove a lot of the uh, drop ceilings and drywall and, and uh, uh, other materials to allow us to really see the building. Um, but uh, here's just a couple more views of, uh, of the fire station. And, and these, these photos really show that, you know, when, these are these are a great example in in, uh, in our work and in, 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 in preservation in general. The the um, the the need to uh, restore and uh, you know keep as much original material as possible, and when inserting new material, as we did here uh, in the uh, ground floor kitchen area. To kind of build in our own time. So you see there's very minimal trim here. 
the, at the kitchen, uh, kind of very clean modern lines uh, so that we're not competing or confusing uh, new construction with original. Uh, just a few more interesting things uh, about the building here. Uh, this is uh, the area well that I showed earlier on floors three, four, and five. Uh, so I'm standing here on the third floor looking up uh, and here on the roof looking down. Uh, this is a great space for the air conditioning units um, for the building. Uh, this, here's a few details from the original stair. Uh, these are tread plates, cast iron tread plates. And you see here the Star of David. Uh, so these, we believe these are original uh, Kayim uh, era, 1893 tread plates, although they could be 1917 uh, Sackowitz editions because there is some interesting kind of uh, paint, paint lines here on the floor that indicate that perhaps there was a, something else, uh, you know, prior to these tread plates. Uh, Here's some of the original stair detailing, um, kind of Victorian uh, detailing at the stair. Uh, a little bit of paint that we were able to scrape away from the stair showing the quality of, uh, of, of wood. Um, and uh, it uh, remains to be seen whether we will scrape all of the wood uh, down in the stair, although uh, I, I certainly hope we do, uh, we do that because originally this would have been most likely stained uh, or tongue oiled wood the stair. Uh, basement here on the left, uh, this is one of the curved brick walls in the basement uh, that we uh, hope to expose. You can see here that it used to have plaster. These are uh, nailing boards uh, that would have held, uh, that would have been used to nail the, the uh, metal plaster lath to the brick. Of course, the wood is now gone, rotted away, and the plaster is uh, turned to dust here on the floor over the many, many years. Um, this is a uh, a peek at one of the cast iron column transitions from basement to first floor. Um, and uh, one of the beams that exists uh, in the, uh, this is I believe in the, uh, this is at the uh, first floor ceiling, second floor uh, structure. This is a beam that's composed of uh, nine inch channels and plate. So it's a, uh, it's a plate girder as it's called, um, a kind of predecessor to the modern uh, I-beam. And then uh, these are some of the uh, really wonderful cast iron exterior column details. And the interior stair, this is at the fifth level, looking down to the uh, small uh, kind of balcony that pokes out at the, uh, at the landing between fourth and fifth floor. And then this is uh, down here between uh, second and third where the landing interrupts uh, or sorry, between first and second, because we have very tall uh, 15 foot uh, first floor ceilings. Um, so the first floor stair actually has three, uh, has two landings. Uh, so this lower landing has these very, very tiny uh, windows. Okay, and again, I wanna thank you to uh, Preservation Houston for, for having me tonight to, uh, to share our work and progress on the Kayan building. And uh, I would love to have your questions um, uh, for, uh, for as long as you, uh, as long as you want to throw them out there. And I think Jim is going to read them if they've been typed in. Yeah. Uh, thanks Joe. That's, it's fascinating to, uh, think about all the history that's, that's contained in, in one building. And, uh, you know, this is in a lot of ways, this is kind of ancient history uh, as, as Houston is concerned. Uh, but that, that makes it all the more special. Yeah, absolutely. No, I hope I really hope some folks will email me some uh, interesting uh, interesting history or knowledge about this building. It's uh, it's, uh, it's really yeah. a, I'm sure somebody knows something out there. You never know uh, when somebody might have a story. We we do have uh, we do have some potential here because we have um, joining us tonight Peter Block and his sister Julie, and they are the great grandkids of Cornelia Kayam, who was Edward's sister. Um, but I already asked Peter and he said that they don't know a whole lot about the Kayams, but hopefully they'll reach out to you and, and uh, maybe they do know some things to kind of fill in the story. Please do. One question that I was curious about too, what is the purpose of that area well? It holds air conditioners now, but it wouldn't have in 1893. True. Um, you know, I, I don't know because there are not 
uh, there are not windows to that area well. Um, there are no windows on that side of the building, at least not that we can see. Now, once we do our selective demolition, there's the sheetrock, uh, uh, you know, uh, at the interior. So it would not surprise me as we as we do some selective demolition to see a, a bricked in windows um, uh, on that area well. Uh, from what I can tell, and and my clue for this, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fly back up here to the original photos. So you'll see here, here's the architect's sign, and then here's a different sign on this window. And there's a, diff, there's a sign on this window here, and then you got New York Life Insurance here. That leads me to believe that this was a double loaded corridor building. And one of the very old uh, floor plans I have uh, shows what I think to be a central, you know, the, the original stair landings would have gone to a central hall. So uh, it, it could very well be that that area well did have windows originally. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, tenement housing from the 18, you know, uh, mid to late 1800s in New York City, uh, there's a common typology called the dumbbell plan. Uh, it looks a lot like this third, fourth, and fifth floors here in Kayan building because of its, uh, you know, kind of dumbbell shape. And the, the purpose of that dumbbell plan was to allow uh, area wells um, to kind of mate together. So if you imagine, let's see, you know, this area well here matching up with another area well next to it, well, now you have a, a, a you know, a grand total of maybe six feet or so. Of course, this ended up being a really terrible plan, uh, you know, at that time, you know, because they filled with trash and, and uh, you know, not a whole lot of light got down to those lower levels on a six story walk up. Um, yeah, uh, so to answer your question, I, I you know, it, yeah, it's quite possible that on, on third, fourth and fifth, fifth floors, there was windows here. Um, mm. And, and you, you're right, certainly not used for uh, any any utilities as, as it is now. Uh, the, yeah. owner, the owner currently has, uh, has a door uh, on the uh, about in this location here on the third floor that allows you to get out into that space um so it's you know it's certainly re real useful yeah that, that's what i was going to say in, the, in those photos you could see i guess it was that that opening and that made me wonder if there had been other other windows there but it, it, that's that's going to be an interesting thing to find out absolutely um so another question that that kind of relates to construction and design of the building um you mentioned that it was uh I guess cast iron on the lower floors and then wood on the upper floors. Uh, Mark asks, was the wood used to reduce expense or was it to reduce weight or, or why was the building framed like that? Mm, great question. So uh, the answer is, is here between second floor and third floor. At the first and second floor, we are holding this line of columns exists and then on third, fourth, and fifth floor, it does not. It it that that becomes a brick wall. So on this on the second floor, I believe they they uh, they used cast iron in order to support the very heavy load of this brick wall above on the second, third, and fifth floors. Essentially, an exterior wall. So you wouldn't want to support a brick wall with wood columns but for a number of reasons. Just the sheer weight of the of the brick. But also the fact that brick, you know, is brick and masonry in general is a conduit for moisture. Uh, so you want to support that with a cast iron column that will, wouldn't be subject to rot over time. Uh, so I, I believe that's why um, that the the cast iron goes up, uh, you know, uh, to the through the second floor. Um, primarily this area well, but it's, it's also, a, you know, there's also weight on those other, on the interior columns as well, uh, the weight of the floors above. So I, I believe that they switched over to wood um, up on the third floor because the loads would allow it and cast iron was certainly more expensive than wood. Uh, the floor framing itself, um, the spans in this building uh, are about a little less than 20 feet uh, there's a center column line all the way down the building. And so the long span here is about 19 feet from the south wall to the center column line. Um, on the ground floor, 
that's done with uh, see the the ground floor framing or basement basement ceiling ground floor framing are three by 14s so those are two and a half inch by 13 and one quarter inch uh, wood members and they're at 16 inch on center on upper levels i have not been able to see them um, i think they're probably two by two by 12 ish maybe a little bit more um, and that's you know there was there was no need to do steel or anything heavier than that at that time um, yeah well and, and we hadn't really gotten into steel construction in Houston yet. I think it would be about 10 more years before we before we got to that point. But we didn't have buildings that 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 needed it either, like you say. So yeah, no, this was one of the bigger buildings in downtown. You know, and there there was uh, steel construction in 1893, but it was, you know, as I showed that I wanted to show that plate girder earlier because that, you know, steel steel at that time was was and cast iron was used sparingly. It was uh very expensive uh, compared to wood, which was coming from the bayou, basically. You know, mm -hmm. the wood came from just just uh, you know just upstream or downstream on the Buffalo Bayou. Yeah, uh, David David Bush points out too that um, since the cast iron was in the Kayam store space, it would take up less room and it would have been prettier than having exposed wood. So maybe it was just yes. a way to fancy up the store floors as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Speaking of the Kayam store space, uh, Mark also asks, um, was there a mezzanine? Is the, is the second floor a mezzanine? No, it's, it's not. Uh, there may have been a mezzanine. There, there actually, um, let's see if I can get, pull the first floor up here. Uh, there is actually currently a mezzanine above the kitchen here. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that was framed fairly contemporary uh, with uh, Mia Bella, the former restaurant that was there. I don't believe that mezzanine is original. Uh, it did allow me to get up and get a close look at the at the uh, at the uh, second floor framing, um, but uh, you know, it, it's until we do our selective demolition, it's it's not really going to be possible for me to see if there was uh, any sort of mezzanine. Um, but with a 16 foot ceiling, it's possible that there was some storage mezzanine uh, framing someplace. Um, yeah, hard to say. Okay. Um, sticking with that, that first floor space, uh, Alan says he recognized the footprint of Mia Bella on one of the floor plans that you showed. Um, he yeah. says it was a, a fun restaurant and a lot of cozy and by cozy, he means the seating was kind of tight. Um, so he was asking if, if, the potential restaurant tenant that, that may end up being on the first floor. Um, I, I, he was asking if there might be a second level to that, but I guess that would be the basement so that yes. that would allow you to free up some extra room, right? Yeah, exactly. We're, you know, uh, everybody is designing with, you know, with COVID in mind now. Um, you know, that it's, it's not much of a stretch for us, though, to think about, you know, natural light, ventilation, outdoor seating. These are, these are things many of us have always really enjoyed. Um, yeah, we do, we are looking to take advantage of some outdoor uh, seating space here. Um, you know, having this door is very important to get, you know, to get good ventilation through and also good circulation. Mm -hmm. uh, the basement level, uh, let's see, you know, this, this, yeah, this would be the second floor. Um, you know, we think that the uh, upper floor has probably better value as either office or residential than than expanded retail space. Yeah. Um, but uh, our real activate this basement level, which, uh, you know, is really, you know, comparatively lower rent space or has has been had been in the past. Um, and, you know, we'd like to see this basement space leasing really at a premium along with the ground floor space. And we, we think that if this stair is, is, is well designed, that it, it, it could, uh, and that if this, uh, you know, the, all the brick, brick walls here are exposed and, and, and nicely refinished, that, uh, you know, that it could, uh, could do that. And I'm glad you mentioned the stair because that, that brings up another question. When you're dealing with uh, a building like this that's in a historic district on the National Register, uh, are there any 
restrictions or considerations when you are inserting a new staircase like that or, or opening up that light well or, or any changes that you make that are kind of to the fabric of the building? Absolutely. Uh, yes. And this was the, one of the first things that, you know, we, uh, when, uh, uh, when Anna uh, Maud with McRosty uh, scheduled our first, uh, our first check-in with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Texas Historic Commission, uh, she and I prepared, uh, you know, uh, in advance to discuss primarily this set of doors, this set of doors, and this stair. Uh, we knew uh, we knew going into that meeting that those would be kind of the hot button issues and would be of primary concern uh, to the Texas Historic Commission. Our my worry as a designer was that you know and this is something that Anna and I talked uh, a fair bit about that they may want you know the Texas Historic Historic Commission may want to see this stair in a less prominent location. You know, maybe maybe up here or you know somewhere a little further away from, you know the the exterior facade of the building. However, as as a designer and as somebody who wants you know my clients to get the most you know bang for their buck and the most rent and viability out of this space, you know I really wanted to have the stair here so that people passing by can see into the basement and see that there's a there's an interesting space down there and people who are in the restaurant can you know can see down into the basement and you know uh, that 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 drives you know that drives commerce that 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 kind of visibility um, you know drives commerce and you know we were really interested in especially in capturing nat uh, natural light from this south facing window and, and letting that light kind of spill spill down into the basement um, you know to create contrast and you know kind of you know, open that space up quite literally. So fortunately, um, you know, the Texas Historic Commission acknowledged, you know, uh, that this was actually a decent spot for the window. Um, one thing that they did ask is that this open uh, area well uh, does not go all the way to the exterior wall that we do carry a little bit of flooring across here. Uh, so that's a change that we're working on. We're, we're uh, working on a 3D model of the stair uh, right now. Um, and then they also asked, uh, let's see, where's my elevations? Uh, oops, that's down here. You know, they asked that we are, uh, mindful of the, of the composition, uh, mm -hmm. here of these doors and, and try to kind of carry, you know, carry the sill line across. Um, so this is kind of our first run at the doors and, uh, and there are no original photographs of this door, uh, that, that we could find anywhere. Um, so, you know, this is just a guess. Uh, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking at this door. My, my first inclination here was to do a double door again. Um, you know, the double door makes a lot of sense here. A pair, uh, a, a pair below a triple with a transom, uh, much like the pair of windows here below the triple, uh, triple set of windows uh, up here on the third floor. So, you know, the, the, the proportions of the old building really guide us here. Um, of course, these are going to be very clean. Uh, uh, you know, these are not freely ornate doors, but kind of uh, more of a shaker style flat panel. Um, so we're really referencing proportions only, not details. And, and the same will be true with this door set over here. If we can detour to the basement for a second, uh, Jim McCallum asks if there was a plumbing problem in the basement. Has there been a plumbing problem in the past? I, I, guess, I guess so. I guess it's just, it's, it's, has, do you know of any plumbing problems in the basement or? Yeah, uh, there is, there is moisture in the basement. I will say that. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a Houston basement after all. Uh, the elevator does have a sump, uh, a sump pit. Uh, it goes down about four feet. I was able to look down in there and there's a little bit of water. There's past water damage that, you know, that we can see there. Mm -hmm. um, anytime there's a restaurant uh, in a in an old building, you know, restaurants are tough tenants. You know, they're, they're the kitchen areas, all the water, the washing down. You know, there there certainly has been some damage, uh, particularly in this area here, uh, from the from the uh, restaurant kitchen above uh, throughout the '90s and 2000s. Um, I'm not aware of any. You know, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a major 
water leak or you know catastrophic issue uh, okay like that but uh, but yeah it there's certainly some signs of wear yeah it may just be kind of maybe jim's thinking about basements in general and, and basements in houston specifically when you're living below the yeah. water line right yeah yeah there's you know there's um yeah there, there's a little bit of moisture in the basement uh probably some comes through the walls you know uh, uh but you know no evidence of any real dry moisture driving through those exterior walls that i could see you know, a lot of a lot of the areas you know around the edges of the buildings uh, particular particularly back here in the mechanical uh, area where there's a, a large fire tank i crawled all the way back here to this little vault area it was all dry as a bone back there uh, so yeah, as, as, as Houston basements go, it's, it's pretty good. They, they knew what they were doing. <laughs> they did. Uh, Frank uh, Donnelly, one of our board members and somebody I think you know, uh, you know Frank. Asks, are there any elements of the building that are difficult to restore? Um, you know, maybe something that, that requires a skilled craftsman that would be, that would be kind of tricky. Um, and then in general, what do you think will be the greatest construction challenge for the building? Mm -hmm. Ooh, good questions, Frank. Um, win windows, existing windows are always the trickiest things uh, to restore. There's just a handful of people in Houston who really know how to, you know, to restore an old window. And, and, and I, can't, I can't emphasize enough the importance of keeping old windows. Um, they are, you know, the, the, you know, the windows are, windows are like the soul of an old building. You know, they, they, uh, you can say, oh yeah, Weather Shield makes a window that looks just like it. It's not. It's just not. You know, there's there are no new windows that are really, you know, that that have the, the capture of the character and quality of old windows. Quality is good, probably going to take some people aback, you know, because old windows, you know, they uh, naysayers will say, well, they leak, they're energy inefficient. You know, all that's all true, uh, but they can be they can be restored to be reasonably effective you know with with uh, with proper spring brass weather stripping and good glazing um you know they they can be okay they're not going to be great in terms of energy efficiency but they can be they can be okay um, uh, the quality of wood in old windows it's tremendous you know the, the windows windows uh and and you know kind of exterior uh wood detailing at this time was made not just of cypress, it was made of old growth heart cypress, you know, the interior, uh, the heartwood of a cypress uh, tree, you know, and these were cypress trees. Think about San Antonio, uh, the cypress trees on the Riverwalk. That's what we had growing up and down all of our bayous here in Houston. And we cut them all down and made houses and buildings out of them. These, these trees were four, five, six feet in diameter. Um, so, you know, that, that heart cypress wood you, you can't get it anymore. It doesn't exist. You know, the wood that these windows are made of is, I believe, priceless, absolutely priceless. And it's no accident that these windows that are 100, almost 130 years old are still there and in decent shape because this wood just will not rot. Um, it's, it's, it's such good, good quality wood, it won't rot. So, so yeah, Frank, to answer your question about about it you're restoring any any restoration work that's going to be needed to be done to the windows on the upper levels and there is some uh, they need some need reglazing some need some repair um, that that has to be done by a real craftsmen uh, and any any of the new doors and woodwork that we do on the ground level similarly that's that's that has to be very very carefully done um, Masonry, you know, repointing masonry uh, again. That always has to be done with a real delicate touch, you know, so that you don't, uh, you know, you don't uh, uh, compromise the uh, the old brickwork, um, you know. Uh, but fortunately, a lot of the exterior is really, really in good shape, so we don't have a lot of that. You know, so much of that heavy lifting again was done back in 1980 by uh, by Barry Moore and the contractors at that time. Um, and then Jim, what, what was the second part of Frank's question? Uh, I, th I think you hit on it. He was asking about any any particular like like uh, challenges for for skilled craftspeople, but also what you thought the the biggest construction challenge might be. And mm -hmm. windows may cover both parts of that question. Yeah, that could be the biggest challenge too. Um, yeah, uh, you know, there there yeah, there I 
there may be some challenges with getting the basement, you know, to, to kind of look and feel right as well. Um, you know, that, that's, I think that's going to be an interesting space uh, just from a design standpoint to deal with. But, you know, the real, the real trick in working with old buildings and, you know, and, and you know, Frank and I have been through this together recently on, uh, you know, on a, on a project, uh, you know, you really have to work with a contractor who, you know, who understands old buildings and, and has patience and has a light touch. You know, contractors so often want to get into an old building and try to make it new. And uh, it's just the wrong way to do it. You know, um, you, you've got to you've got to approach these buildings as though every bit of the existing uh, fabric of the building is is precious and and priceless, and, and it is. Yeah, keep keep as many of those historic elements as you can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> coming back to the basement for a sec, uh, Jim McCallum says the reason he was asking about the plumbing problem is he heard water in the basement was the reason that Mia Bella gave uh, when they closed their location in the Cayenne building. And then that may be, I'm not, I'm not uh, familiar with it, but. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that either. Um, we do have a couple of fans of <laughs> the idea of um, residential space on the upper floors. Uh, Ooh, oh, I was wondering if we'd get any, if, if anybody would uh, respond to that, uh, that little provocation there. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that means they're ready to move in, but maybe they are. Uh, okay. Hey, send me an email. And, and Mark, Mark <laughs> I, know that, I know that I know that our clients will be interested to hear any feedback on that. That's something that we've been debating with our clients, you know, for the last uh, a couple months or so. And the more I think about it, the more I feel like, uh, you know, maybe these would make interesting, you know, full floor flats because they're they're about, you know, net interior square footage is going to be somewhere in the 35, 3,500 square foot range after you take the stairs out and the elevator out. It's about, you know, coming, it's right around 3,500 square feet, which is a pretty generous uh, square footage for, uh, you, know, you could do a two, uh, three bedroom, two and a half bath uh, floor plan uh, with some, with some very generous spaces. Uh, you know, and, and, th and though it does have an elevator, it's really just five floors. So you can walk up and down a very, you know, kind of open airy staircase. And, you know, for those who might want to, might want to live downtown without, you know, without living in a high rise and sharing an elevator with uh, 200 of your closest friends, this could be a good option. Yeah, you can, you can have the full New York experience of, of having a fifth floor walk up too, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Miss it. <laughs> um, Mark points out that that it could give some longevity to the remodel with with HOA fees or or rent if they were, if they were rental properties. And Julie Fairbanks says she's wanted to have an apartment in that building for the last twenty years. So uh, so there's definitely some interest there. We'll we'll see. Great. Well, uh -huh. yeah, y'all, yeah, please, yeah, drop me an email or 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 connect with Jim. He'll connect us. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's keep uh, pushing this idea along. And just just a couple of a couple more to, to bring this home. Um, let's see. Uh, we well, we had. I, I'll combine two questions into one. Um, what's the anticipated timeline for the project, and and when might the decision be made on how the different spaces would be used? Oh boy, I, I'm afraid there is a one word answer to those two questions, and it's yeah. COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we've 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 been working on this project at a slow pace per, you know, per the per the uh, for our clients uh, wishes for oh, probably the last six or seven months now. Um, and that suited us just fine too. Uh, you know, with the work, folks working from home and, you know, we're pretty busy in our office, but this, you know, not to diminish how how much we love this project. It is a wonderful building. And yeah, we, uh, you know, I, I'm right now I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, uh, you know, to answering some more questions about not, not just the structure and the quality of original of the space and the, you know, some of the kind of hidden features, uh, you know, but but also some design questions when we do some selective demolition. It's, it's really going to be great to kind of strip strip away the layers, you know. So much so much of uh, so much of historic renovation. It's not it's not about what you do. It's about what you don't do, uh, and it's about removing you know removing the layers uh, that have happened over the years. Um, you know all the all the various stages of of remodeling that happened to 
you know, to the, that kind of happened to old buildings, you know, so much of so much of a good restoration project or renovation project or adaptive reuse, if you will, is, is just kind of taking those layers away and, and revealing, um, you know, the, the, you know, the original structure uh, for what it is. So, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to that as a next step. And, uh, you know, who knows, you know, when we, you know, maybe in a few months, if this, uh, this vaccine makes its way around we could uh, you know we could even you know, do a do a a, a walkthrough in person I, I i know a lot of people would love to see this um, and that's something we've talked about with uh, with the real estate broker uh, that that we've been uh, speaking with with, the, with our clients as well that uh, once we do that uh, selective demolition and just take all the walls away and we have wide open spaces um, you know that's that's really going to do a lot uh, to kind of get people excited about the building, potential tenants, uh, potential, you know, uh, you know, whether, whether that be office or residential or, uh, or commercial on the ground floor. Uh, when we just kind of strip this thing back, we're going to, you know, I think we're all going to be, have a, have a real, uh, a real treat. Well, we'll, uh, we'll have to get you back to, to do the, the post project presentation when, when this is all over. I can't wait to see how it comes out. Love that. Yeah, thanks Before so much. Before and after. Before and after, yeah. Th this was great, Joe. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Joe. That, we really are looking forward to seeing seeing what's happening with this building and really happy that that the work's being done. Uh, oh, Jim, thank thanks for, for organizing the program. But oh, I see a finger. Before you, yeah, that, that's the, <laughs> I, I forgot one thing. Joe, would you mind just quickly repeating your email address if anybody wants to drop you a line? I will throw it up here on screen real quick. It's, there, there we go. Joe at metalabstudio.com. All right. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, if you're not a member, please go to preservationhouston.org slash join. Jim has got a full calendar of programs scheduled after the first of the year. We'll have programs with award-winning authors Stephen Fenberg and Barry Scardino Bradley, award-winning photographer Paul Hester, and uh, we have reimagined our signature fundraising event, the Cornerstone Dinner, as the Cornerstone Drive-In, presenting the 2021 Good Brick Awards. Construct uh, driving in the East End. Everything's in the East End now. Uh, Preservation Houston members will be receiving inf invitations uh, in January. Uh, thank you all for being here. Have a good, enjoy the holidays, and we'll see you back after the first of the year. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, David. Have a good night. Good night.